Okay, I think most people have joined us now and the, the waiting room's empty. So uh, welcome everyone to the 2021 CUSPI uh, wrap up event. Um, we are here today to hear from the 2021 challenges and what they've done. And for those who don't know about CASPI or who haven't been involved in the policy challenges, um, CASPI is an organization, um, it's a Cambridge University Science and Policy Exchange, and we are an organization for undergraduate PhD students, postdocs, um, we are all different stages, who are interested in science and policy and science for policy, and throughout the year we run um, a variety of different events. We have lectures, we have workshops, we have our own journal. Um, and one of our streams are also the policy challenges. That's a program where we collaborate with the Cambridgeshire County Council and um, teams of researchers apply to work on projects that have been set by the council for about six months. Um, do some research into questions that have been um, proposed by the council and then in the end um, present that to the council members and present a range of policy recommendations um, that they yeah, conclude from their findings during the project. Um, and yeah, today we're here to hear from the 2020 cohort, um, what they've done, what they've found, uh, and anyone who's interested in picking up a challenge in the 2021 um, or possibly in the 2021 um, year, um, yes, welcome come to listen in and yeah, ask questions and see whether you'd be interested in doing a policy challenge yourself. I think I'm going to hand over to Dustin or Ian now. Ian. Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone. I'm uh, I'm Councillor Ian Manning, so I'm the person that founded this um, in, in in four years ago, and it really has been the most rewarding thing I've been involved in as a councillor. I've been a councillor ten years. Um, it's not normally something you get on the doorstep, though. Uh, so it was a great pleasure that, um, as all my uh, fellow councillors on the call will know, as of as of Monday, we were legally allowed to go out and knock on doors for the first time since the pandemic um, started. And of course, normally when you knock on a resident's door, they complain about potholes or the bins or something that's immediate to them. So it was a great surprise that um, during a, on Saturday afternoon, someone turned around and said, thought very carefully about what I said. I said the usual introduction prop question, which is anything I can help with or anything you're interested in. Thought very, very carefully and then said, what do you know about evidence-based policy? At which point I went, well, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that. And then was able to tell um, the young person all about the um, policy challenges, which was particularly rewarding, not just because it was, it was actually answering the question, but also because it was totally showing a young person how you could get really in, interested in politics um, at a local level as well as a national one. Um, the only thing I want to say is that the other really rewarding thing about this is that um, a lot of politics is very necessary and a lot of the party politics that goes on is very necessary because we have different ideas and different viewpoints on things. But one of the things I think the policy challenge has done is um, is bring everyone together because fundamentally I'm a really nice guy and I just want everyone to get along. And one of the things the policy challenge does is cut through some of the some of, some of the bits of nonsense that we involve ourselves in. And you can see that brilliantly by all the presentations at the committees when what can be a particularly raucous committee meeting, suddenly the CUSPI team comes forward and presents and suddenly all that goes away. And then all that was really interesting in is, 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 is recognizing the brilliant work that previous years have done that's happened this year. Um, and I just want to say one final thing, which is um, a huge thank you, thank you to, to both Amanda for always supporting us at a senior level, particularly though to Dustin, who's run this for the last two years and done all the hard work rather than take the glory. He's been absolutely brilliant. Um, and I'm very pleased to hand over to him now. Thank you, Ian. Very good for that. Um, I just want to say that, you know, I, it does seem as though the, the policy challenges get better every year. And I think that's even more impressive um, this year with the challenges that 2020 brought, you know, the entire world. And like every organization, you know, we had to adjust to competing priorities um, or quickly shifting priorities, I should say. And on top of that, you know, we had a couple teams who had to do ethics approvals, and that was a learning experience for us as well. And amidst all of that, these researchers just showed such an admirable level of patience, perseverance, and uh, commitment on top of the um, talent and insight that you can see in their work. And 
I just want to say, you know, special congratulations to this year's group for continuing to raise the standard in, in, in those. Um, so just, I just want to briefly touch on um, each of the four policy challenge questions you're going to hear tonight, just to kind of give, give a big picture introduction, and then you get all the interesting details from everything that you're going to hear about tonight, um, all the topics are central to the council's um, efforts to make Cambridgeshire a great place to live for everyone. And the work of the first team you'll hear from tonight touches on our goal of protecting and caring for those who need, it, need us, because it focused on how we can best support the children who have been in our care when they become adults and need to make the transition into an independent adulthood with more challenges than the average young adult has. And the second, the work of the second team you'll hear from tonight connects to our goals of putting communities at the heart of everything we do and promoting a good quality of life for everyone because it looked at how the council can help create the conditions for communities to develop their own initiatives towards health and well-being that lessen the need for more formal health and social care services. Um, that work is really key to what we call our Think Communities approach at the council, which aims to transform the relationship between communities and the public sector by, among, among other things, paying special attention to the unique strengths and needs that each of our different communities have. And the work of the third team you'll hear from tonight um, takes that to our goal zero emissions by 2050. Uh, this team focused on our young graphic to reach this goal. And they looked at how the environmental priorities of our young people range across the county, how those priorities could be managed and the best ways to continue to engage uh, our young people. And the work of the final team you'll hear from tonight looks at our net zero goal from the perspective of another part of Cambridgeshire that we need to work with and that's local businesses. Um, and this team proposed a decarbonization fund that local businesses could invest in uh, to fund carbon neutral and carbon negative projects across the county. Um, so that's the kind of overall picture of the topics you'll hear from. The details you'll see are more interesting when you hear from the teams themselves. Um, but just very quickly, I'll, um, I want to just hand over to Councillor Schumann if he's here. I think he just wanted to say a few words because he's not able to stay um, for the entire event. Thank you, Dustin. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, so I just wish to firstly apologize for having to jump into your agenda uh, so rudely. Um, but uh, one thing for any of you researchers uh, that will be joining us, and I hope that's many of you uh, in the next challenge, the one thing you'll realize is members uh, often find themselves trying to juggle appointments and uh, fit in what they can. So tonight is with one of those examples and, and I wish it were an appointment to get my hair sorted, but that will have to wait a few weeks, I think. Um, but I wanted to, to just, uh, before I uh, allowed this wrap up session to, to happen without me, I wanted to thank sincerely all of those that worked on the two questions uh, in, that you're going to hear about um, in a few moments that I had an involvement with. Uh, you know, obviously, who you are, and I won't try and list all of your names. I'm sure I'd end up missing someone. So uh, I just wanted to thank you sincerely from a uh, uh, councillor's perspective. You have made it both interesting and also enjoyable. And that's not uh, some two words I often use uh, when it comes to local government. So, uh, so thank you sincerely for that. Uh, for all of you prospective uh, researchers and people who are just finding out the kind of thing we're doing, uh, please do uh, get involved if you are able to and you are keen to, because it is a hugely, I hope for the, uh, the research will confirm, a hugely rewarding process that has uh, potentially really significant impacts on the shaping of local government in Cambridgeshire and beyond. Um, and one example of the beyond is having been involved with this for a few years now, um, we've had a lot of linked uh, uh, questions and challenges to the environment and uh, it was uh, a great honour to hear that government uh, recently are looking at carbon pricing and cited Cambridge's uh, methodology for carbon pricing as an example that they would be using in uh, potentially evaluating how they consider carbon pricing uh, going forward 
and the premise of that work is not only being fronted by our officers and brilliant officers at Cambridgeshire, but by the work that the researchers have carried out this year and in previous years. So there is no limit to, uh, to what this, this work can achieve. Um, and so I will, without further ado, I've already taken far too much of your time, but thank you, Dustin, hugely. And for, again, for anyone that will be working on the research project, Dustin is an amazing uh, coordinator and tries very hard to, to herd the cats that are the members and the officers together um, and bring us all together in keeping it moving forward. So thank you, really a huge thanks to Dustin for your work on this. So that's it. I will, I will sort of bid you a good evening and, and thank you again for your time. Now we'll go to comments from um, um, the uh, Policy Challenge Senior Management Lead, um, Amanda Askham. Thank you very much, Peace. I, I won't take up any more time because the exciting thing is to get into the challenge questions. I suppose for me, it's just, it's an honor and a pleasure always to be part of this program. Um, been working on it with Ian from, from the beginning, which I think is about four or five years isn't it Ian so the, the quality is always fantastic the engagement is always fantastic and I think I just uh, echo what Josh Schumann just said where this goes is is limitless actually we rely on these challenges to really inform our policy we push the recommendations hard and be really bold we have seen some significant and fundamental changes in policy and practice coming out of um, these pieces of research. So they're, they're fantastic pieces of work and I'm looking forward to hearing them all together at this wrap up event. Be great. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. So without further much ado, because um, I mean, we're already, we're already behind time, um, let's get into the policy challenges. Um, so I'll be introducing the first um, team, which will be talking about the question, what does the evidence tell us about the type of support that would have the most impact on ensuring our care leavers can make a successful transition from being a supported young person into an independent adult, including the transition from education to work. And this will be presented by um, Ellie Blake, Patrick, um, Maria, Ernestine, and Anna. So I would just love to hand over to them now. Peace. Peace. I just, I just very, very quickly need to say something just for the benefit of everyone present. So um, all the policy challenges have been through the committee process, apart from the very first one. Um, so I need to say a big thank you to Simon, Councillor Simon Bywater, who's the chair of the, the relevant committee for this first challenge, but because it hasn't actually been through the committee process yet. Um, we've had to ask the team not to present their recommendations because it would be inappropriate for something that hasn't been democratically voted through to be presented outside of that. So, and, and the, team, the team are very understanding it's just timing um so i won't get in the way anymore but that's just to explain why you won't hear the recommendations at the end of the first team's um presentation yeah sure so the first team can take over now hi can i share my screen yeah sure um it says host disabled participant screen sharing okay um I have to make you host, I guess. Um, Lisa, could you help? So whoever is the host will need to make Maria the co-host. Yeah, so Pace is the host. Um, but yeah, you can either, yeah, it would be great if you could make me host again and make Maria co-host. So when you go to the list of participants on the right under more, you can see that. I think it will be Mersini on, on, um, oh, it's Miriam. Is that okay now? Let me try. No. Okay. I've gone to the list of participants and I can't seem to like find more. So. Peace, peace. Yeah. I think the easiest thing to do is if you right click on Lisa's face, I mean, not literally, obviously, but Lisa? and then select make host. Sure. And then mm. she should, if you right click on her screen, you should see the option to make her host. Okay. Yeah. And okay. then Lisa can. Yeah, perfect. That worked. Thank you. Maria, are you able to share now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So can you see the full screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Mersini and I'm part of the Q1 research group. On behalf of the group, I would like to first thank you for the opportunity to present our research, which we believe could potentially significantly improve the quality of life of not only young people living here in Cambridgeshire, but nationally. As mentioned by Ian, unfortunately, we will not be able to present our specific recommendations today as we haven't gone through committee yet, but we will do our best to go through our methodology as well as the general overarching areas we investigated in relation to young people leaving care. In England, there are more than 75,000 children and young people in care, with the numbers increasing since 2010. When a child or young person enters care, the local authority becomes their corporate parent. Few minutes isn't enough to sufficiently cover the intricate journey and obstacles young people in care experience from the moment they were separated from their birth families up to the point where they, were, where they become independent. As a few issues these young people may have faced in their journey to adulthood, they may have been separated from an abusive relationship within their family, suffering from mental health issues, or trying to deal with traumatic events that have occurred to them. As corporate parents, local authorities have the legal and moral duty to try and provide the best possible support that any good parent will provide to their child. The critical question local authorities should continuously ask themselves is, would this be good enough for my child? Although the duty of care of local authorities for young people leaving care extends until the age of 25, support significantly recedes when a young person turns 18. Young people leaving care must quickly adapt to independent living and greater responsibility at a time in their lives when support is reduced, with many struggling to adapt to their new circumstances. Care experience is associated with a higher risk of poor outcomes, including mental health problems, social marginalization, homelessness, unemployment, custody and early death. This does not need to be the case. Young people with care experience are often victims of circumstance, but have the potential to lead successful adult lives. Cambridgeshire County Council has more than 400 open cases of young people with care experience below the age of 25. The research question provided to us by Councillor Liz Avery and Specialist Personal Advisor Joe Gilbert was, what does the evidence tell us about the type of support that would have most impact on ensuring our care leavers can make a successful transition from being a supported young person into an independent adult, including the transition from education to work? Patty will now go through how we approach this question. Thank you. Thanks, Mersini. So we utilized a broad methodology when, which embraced various perspectives. We carried out a literature review and scoped out the policy landscape in Cambridgeshire and further afield. However, at the core of our report is a comparative approach which sets Cambridgeshire and its policies against other local authorities, particularly geographical and statistical neighbours. Our recommendations and the report overall are framed by the principles of Cambridgeshire's Think Communities initiative, with the aim of building resilience amongst this community, that being Cambridgeshire's young people, so as to create a basis for community-led engagement in the future. We were also very keen to gather and understand the perspectives of Cambridge's young people, the, the prime beneficiaries of our report. We were able to use the results of a survey circulated on behalf of Cambridge County Council in 2019. However, we felt it was necessary to create a bespoke survey for this project. To this end, we created a survey and our survey questions were molded by three things. First, the response to the 2019 survey. Second, the outcome of focus groups with Cambridgeshire's young people, and third, discussions amongst our, our stakeholders. Our survey was anonymous so as to ensure that recipients could convey their views and experiences freely, and any free text responses that had any identifying information were not included in the report or that it was redacted. Participants had the opportunity to receive a time credit, which can be used uh, for activities in lieu of money for participating, and for this we needed to gather some details. So as to maintain the anonymity of the survey, a link was provided at the end of the main survey to a time credits form. And therefore, when they filled out the second form, it was not possible for us to link names or details back to the survey answers. The survey was originally approved by, uh, approved by officers in the council. However, it was very important for us that our survey did not cause any relived trauma for participants or caused any distress. To this end, we also submitted it to one of the university's ethics committees. This process took time and led us to extending the project, one of the reasons why we have not yet been to committee. The ethical protocol of the survey was ultimately considered satisfactory, 
and it was then sent out to young people by council officers via email. As with the 2019 survey, and in the case more generally with this group, engagement with the survey was relatively low. To address this, the survey responses were considered in the context of a broader body of evidence and our wider methodological approach, bringing in research literature, examples of best practice and expertise, and this helped to address this issue. I'm now going to pass on to Anna, who will walk through some of the things that we looked at. Anna, you, Anna, you, um, you're muted. Thanks, Paddy. <laughs> it's the first time that's happened, actually. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, accommodation and mental health as two of the key areas of focus that we looked at in our research. The word stability came up multiple times in our research. Stability is key to a successful transition from care to independence. Stability in home lives, relationships, and educational work is also one of the corporate parenting principles. And these are principles that are followed by local authorities, such as Cambridgeshire County Council, when supporting their looked after children and young people. There are many factors that can influence the stability of this transition, but the three areas that we chose to focus on were accommodation, mental health and finances. The transition from care to independence is a time of great upheaval that coincides with a steep decline in many types of support. From our survey, many young people who had left care in Cambridgeshire were particularly concerned about accommodation and their mental health. We considered how this transition might affect mental health, as well as the knock-on effects that existing mental health conditions may have on other aspects of their lives. This is particularly important given that nationally, around half of young people in care have a diagnosable mental health disorder. We also considered how the current housing allocation process in Cambridgeshire might affect the transition to independence. Young people leaving care in Cambridgeshire need safe and affordable homes to move into. But unfortunately, unaffordable housing and home homelessness are key concerns when it comes to accommodation. A national study by Centrepoint found that 86% of the 87 young people that they had surveyed had slept rough in the past. Good mental health and accommodation are both important for a stable and successful transition from care to independence. And they're also interlinked and linked with finances. For example, unsafe or unaffordable housing may have a ne negative effect on mental health. I'm now going to hand over to Ellie to discuss finances, which is the third area of support that we consider. Thanks, Anna. Um, so, yeah, the final area that we focused on, which was raised as an area of concern by our survey respondents, uh, was the finances of care experienced young people. Um, as mentioned, the transition from the care system to independence is a very sharp one, and a lot of these young people feel that they're unable to manage their money. So to look at finances as an area, we firstly considered the financial obligations of these young people, which may place pressure on them. Um, and in particular, the differences in these between Cambridgeshire and other local authorities. We looked at employment as a means through which uh, the young people can gain financial stability. Uh, with a particular focus on the opportunities available to these young people to gain exp experience in the workplace. Uh, finally, we looked at their financial education and how prepared they are to manage their money when living independently. We looked at this um, in terms of the information they received directly from the local offer um, and the information provided to them via their personal advisors, including how finances are considered during the pathway planning process. So that concludes our um, summary of how we approached our research question. Um, we think it was a really, really worthwhile topic to look into, which could have a real direct impact on the lives of these young people. And we've really enjoyed researching it. Um, as mentioned earlier, we haven't been able to outline our specific recommendations because the report hasn't been to committee yet. Um, but we'll be presenting at the Children and Young People's Committee on the 6th of July, I believe. Um, this will be uh, live streamed and is open to the public, so please feel free to come along if you want to hear more about our research. We're very excited to share it. Um, and finally, a massive thank you to Joe, Liz and Dustin for all their help with this project, and we welcome any questions. Thank you, Team One. Um, I'd suggest that unless anyone has um, yeah, some questions on the, um, well, some very general questions, um, I'd suggest that if there are some specific questions on the research, um, we can, or you can talk to the researchers directly in the 
networking event that we have afterwards. So unless there's anything on the understanding of your recent pre uh, research or presentation, um, maybe talk to the researchers directly. And we move on to, um, I think Dustin, you said Councillor Mark Goldzak wanted to say something as well. Is Mark here? Yeah, he is. I can see him. Very good. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to continue the theme of a few thank yous, if I can. Um, first of all, Dustin and the team, uh, this can't happen without your support, so thank you from us. Uh, secondly, Councillor Ian Manning, not only is it a brilliant idea, mate, to actually take it through and bring it through and make it happen and see the difference it's making. Uh, team one, you've just presented. Let me just tell you something and I'll share with you. Um, my wife will kill me if she hears me in the office here saying this, but her and I are actually on the path towards being foster parents for Cambridgeshire County Council at the moment. And that is not in part because of the research that I've been following with you guys. So believe us, it has a huge impact. And we're looking at teenagers in particular. So, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a credit to everybody. But I'd really just want to take a two minute opportunity to thank uh, certain people for dealing with a very awkward question I think we set. Um, so Tarry in bed, Alice Foster Eth Etherington, Fletcher Etherington, sorry, Jenny Leggett, Kirsty McKinley, Charlotte Radina, and Ivan Simpson Kent. I thank you. I thank you very much. You will recall when you did present to the committee, it was met with such gushing feedback. You must have all had red faces for the rest of the day. But I know that that has had a huge effect on our Cambridge local program and everything that's coming. So I just want to take the opportunity of wishing everybody well. If there's anybody watching this and sitting on the fence as shall I, shan't I, shall I get involved? Trust me, if it's as a half as rewarding for you researchers as it has been for us at our end, for our time we put in, don't hesitate, don't miss a great opportunity, go for it. Thank you very much, Dustin. So let's move to the second team. Um, they'll be talking about how the council's um, decision-making influence the ability of Cambridgeshire communities to develop um, initiatives that lessen the need for formal health and social care services. So can team two start their presentation? Um, could somebody make me host or allow screen sharing, please? I think it's fine, you could. It, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Lisa? Yeah, sorry, I've just been a bit too slow. You should be able to do that now. <laughs> Thank you. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Cool. Uh, Charlotte's going to start. So. Charlotte, you're on mute. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for letting us present. So um, I will start by giving a bit of a background of our research project. So if you wouldn't mind um, going forward on the slide, Jenny. Thank you. So the question we looked at was, how does the council policy influence the ability of Cambridgeshire communities to develop initiatives that lessen the need for formal health and social care services? So we started by looking into the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough context, uh, which I will briefly summarise. So in general, we found that both areas have quite a lot of natural assets as well as strong economic growth. And despite though the strong economic growth in the area, there is also a lot of deprivation and inequality, making Cambridge the most unequal city in the UK. So also we had to look at the overall um, health and social determinants for both Cambridge and Peterborough, and found that although they are above national average, there are still quite a few pockets of deprivation, which are worse for certain um, areas compared to others. So you might have a small area within a larger area, which suffers more. Uh, so we also uh, had a look at um, the needs for these areas and found that the main needs are reducing health inequalities, alcohol abuse, mental health, road traffic injury and percentage of overweight and inactive people. Uh, so we had a look as well at what the Cambridge County Council has already been doing and the initiatives and policies which are in place as well to meet the prediction growth of population growth. Uh, so we um, 
in particular explored the different ways of developing resilient, healthy communities by empowering individuals and empowering them as well to make their own decisions for their community, while also considering uh, existing projects that the Council has already in place, such as the Input Cares and Think Communities, which are further investigated in the report. I'm now going to hand over to Jenny, who is going to discuss the methodology we followed. Oh, I've gone too far. Right, so um, to kind of address that question that Charlotte was just talking about, we first performed a rap rapid literature review um, for data both in the UK and um, abroad uh, to look at whether community-led initiatives can affect health and well-being and how that's been done elsewhere. But we also designed and distributed a survey to local community initiatives, so to the leaders of these uh, community initiatives. Um, and we wanted to kind of ask these people, first of all, do you think that your initiatives improve health and well-being? Um, is your initiative impacted by growth? How can the council support your initiative? Um, and kind of tie that up with the research that we'd already done. Um, we had 146 responses, which was amazing. Um, and then we held interviews with a few of the respondents. So in chapter three, we uh, basically wanted to investigate whether community-led initiatives can lessen the need for formal health and social care service. Um, we kind of, we know that engaging the community in healthcare commissioning is beneficial for health outcomes. So, you know, if you involve the community in making decisions about what kind of services are gonna be in the community, that's always good. But we wanted to know whether we could take this a step further and actually could we empower communities to be sort of like healthcare providers um, we know that communities have a lot of assets as well as health needs so the assets you know include infrastructure social networks skills and knowledge but also we know that communities are arguably best placed to identify problems in the community and to identify the most effective way of addressing those problems um, and so we looked into the research and this it has been trialed on a number of um a number of occasions across the uk um and the research has shown that community-led initiatives um consistently improve health and well-being so generally we find that uh, the initiatives will improve social networks and reduce loneliness which seems to lead to improving health seeking behaviors and reducing risk behaviors also improving mental health which can then lead to improved health outcomes um, and that applies to all types of initiatives. So it could just be a choir or a sewing club, but you also get additional benefits for health related initiatives like cooking clubs and exercise clubs. You get improved um, health literacy. And we also saw that we, um, there were massive financial savings. So taking, in com taking this research in combination with the outcome of the survey in which we found that most Cambridgeshire um, initiatives find that their initiative improves the health and well-being of both participants and volunteers, we recommended to the County Council that um, they should kind of support communities to devise their own solutions and also map the assets of each community um, alongside their needs to see where they can have the most input. So I'm going to pass on to Tarion. Yeah, so chapter four built on that, as we had shown that community groups uh, are vital to health, we then tried to look at the effect of growth on health, well-being and community-led initiatives. Uh, and we used the survey to do this, and the survey overwhelmingly said that there was an increased demand for community groups in Cambridgeshire. Um, many of the community groups were actually able to keep up with demand but a significant proportion were not. So we also asked what Cambridgeshire County Council could do to help them um, cope with the increased demand for their community groups. And the two key themes that came back from this were venues and volunteers. So our recommendations from this chapter included things like supporting community centres and infrastructure and new developments, uh, improving the provision of affordable venues in existing communities, uh, helping community groups advertise themselves to boost volunteer uh, recruitment and helping to support volunteer continuity post pandemic as many people have started volunteering in the pandemic and uh, this could be a great resource to use in the future um, and then if you could move on a slide uh, chapter five looked at how localism and by that i mean the devolution of power to local organizations can empower residents within areas of growth 
Localism as a policy agenda has the potential to bestow greater agency and responsibility to individuals and groups operating on a local level. It can, in theory, recast local authorities as enablers rather than providers of community-led public caregiving services. However, failing to pursue localism in a sensitive and informed way can lead to a postcode lottery of support infrastructure, meaning those residing in areas containing a large proportion of highly skilled and free-time rich residents benefit from a higher quality of locally provided facilities. Similarly, devolving power to localities can lead to decisions and power being disproportionately held by those within the community who are more vocal and more able to draw upon social capital. This can lead to a system of care and governance which instead reinforces inequality and, and underrepresentation rather than counters it. However, our research found that a community that community led programs and local policies which took a bottom up approach and supported diverse methods of communication were more likely to achieve social inclusivity. We recommended that to achieve inclusivity, Cambridgeshire County Council should support communication platforms between residents and volunteers that are dynamic, informal and culturally sensitive. An emphasis should also be placed on positive quotas within the local governing bodies and also within community led organisations seeking to receive financial support or recognition from local government. Accordingly, we also recommended that data on the level of diversity with local organisations should also be continuously collected and publicly reported. Uh, I'll now pass on to Alice to talk about the next chapter. Thanks, Tarian. Um, so chapter six reported the results of just one section of the questionnaire that asked respondents about how council decision-making impacts their community groups. So this section included a question, how could the council help your initiative? And answers to this question fell into 10 categories, which included obvious things that you might expect, like funding and facilities, but also more nuanced topics, such as increasing the recognition and understanding of the work of community groups, improving relationships, and acknowledging and utilising community knowledge. Using these comments and anecdotal evidence from both community groups and council workers, we developed four further recommendations that you can see here that also drew upon evidence from earlier chapters. These recommendations were predominantly aimed at the Think Communities Partnership, which is a collaboration between the County Council and the constituent um, Cambridge and, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough District Councils. Um, this partnership seeks to transform tran uh, traditional approaches of health and social care delivery using a framework that is specifically place-based and also community-focused. Um, so next slide, please, Jenny. Uh, so we presented our report to the Council Communities and Partnerships Committee in December. And if you're interested, you can watch the recording on YouTube. It, it was really well received, like Mark said, we got some really great feedback and the, both the officers and councillors seemed really genuinely pleased with what we'd done and really grateful for what we'd managed to do. Um, to widen the audience of our report, we've also published it on the Social Sciences preprint server called Stock Archive. Um, so if you'd like to read our report, if you just search, search for Cambridge Council on that website, you'll be able to find it. Um, we've also been told that it's been read by people at Greater Manchester Combined Authority, which is really great. And um, there's also been discussions about the implementation of our recommendations within the Cambridge County Council as well. Um, next slide, please, Jenny. Um, so we'd just like to thank um, Dustin for all his really hard work. He continues um, to help us to disseminate our research even further, even though we finished the project a while ago now. Um, Amanda and Mark, who conceptualised this project, um, and they really led us kind of take it in the direction that we wanted it to go. Um, and we're always super supportive of, of what we wanted to do with it. Um, then of course, the 146 Cambridgeshire community groups who took part in our survey. Um, it was a re really amazing to see the amount of work and effort they put into supporting communities within Cambridgeshire. Um, and I've just noted down the, the five that we interviewed here, um, which were kind enough to let us interview them and really gave, gave us great insights into their work. Um, so that's it. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Q2 team. That's really, really nice. Um, uh, is there any, are there any questions you want to ask the Q2 team? Okay. Um, I mean, they are always like available 
you can read their report and also you can talk to them via the chat um, icon. Um, so we'll quickly go to the next team, which is um, talking about how you could use community-based networks and resources to jointly tackle the climate emergency of our communities. So I'll pass on to the Q3 team now. Thank you, Peace. That is uh, my own team. Thank you, Izzy, for putting up the slides. Um, yeah, I've been um, working with a very great team on um, using community-based resources to tackle the climate change emergency within Cambridgeshire communities. And originally, we didn't have the youth focus, um, but that came in. Um, Izzy, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. I came in when we were looking at the Cambridgeshire County Council's climate change and environment strategy consultation, where we found that um, of all the responses, um, only three of them were under 24 years old. And that was despite um, it being known that the age group, or especially younger people, care a lot about climate change and are very engaged and active in, in climate change action. Um, yet the consultation had only very few responses from young people. Um, so that's why we gave our research a youth-based focus. Um, and we also found that the respondents were not evenly distributed across the county, but we had a lot more responses from Cambridge City and uh, South Cambridgeshire, but not so much from, from other more rural areas. Um, so that's why we made that one of the well, that's why we made that the focus of our research um, and we looked into how the council has used community engagement um, previously to um, engage with communities and we found that they are using a community land trust model where groups are managing their own resources um, so we were looking a bit more into that and we also looked a bit more into champion type models where yeah, um, a champion motivates a group of people to take action. Um, so Izzy, can you go to the next slide? Um, so that's what we had in mind when we started the project that we were um, would look into whether one of these two engagement um, strategies would work better than um, the other for young people uh, and what model, yeah, would be best to engage young people on climate uh, change and the climate emergency. Um, and we were also looking at how young people are currently engaging with climate change action and with the county council. And with that in mind, we were yeah, looking into um, developing the policy recommendations for the council and how they should engage with young people on climate change issues in the future. Um, and Izzy, maybe you could go to the methods section. Yeah, so we started off with literature review on what I've just said on the different engagement methods and um, what's been done already and what other councils have done. Um, and then we did um, small focus groups um, with young people um, from the different areas, not only from, Cam well, not, not just from Peterborough and Cambridge City, but also from more rural areas. Um, and we engaged with yeah, groups of six, seven people via Zoom to see what their opinion is and what they think. Um, and after that, we did a wider survey to reach a wider audience and more people um, and ask more refined questions based on the findings from the focus group. And I think Izzy is now taking you through that findings and the focus groups. Um, so, as Lisa mentioned, the first uh, thing that we did was to carry out some focus groups um, with young people um, in the area. Um, so this um, was, um, fell into three main sections during the focus group. The first um, was that we did a ranking exercise with the young people. Um, and we found here that mitigation against climate change was more important to them than adapting to any climate change and um, natural capital um, these are the words that the council uses, um, like the biodiversity around, for example, in green spaces. Uh, we also found um, a, a knowledge gap. We found that young people were very knowledgeable about um, global issues of climate change, uh, but they were less knowledgeable about local issues specific to the county. Um, the next part of our focus group was a sticky note exercise, um, like here on the slide, where we asked people, um, asked the young people about what they currently do. Um, to take climate action and what's stopping them. Um, and we found that lots of eco-positive behaviors were recorded by the young people 
um, all of the available options out there are pretty much being taken. Um, but some of the barriers were common, um, as you might expect, cost, um, convenience, time, um, but also uh, a very common one for the young people was that they were not um, the, the head of the household or the main decision maker in the household. Um, so then the final part of the focus groups um, looked um, at uh, deciding whether the young people would prefer more of a land trust, uh, like a community um, land trust or environmental trust model um, that we uh, learned about in our literature review or whether a communion, community champions model um, would be better. And we did this through the form of a role play. Um, and we actually found that there wasn't a preference for one over the other. Um, the pros and cons of both were discussed in detail by the groups um, and perhaps a hybrid engagement model might be better. But it was really important to the young people that there was good representation in these groups um, and particularly geographically um, city versus rural areas. Um, the young people were keen to have funding from the council to support these activities, but were also keen um, to raise their own funds. Um, as this links into the next point, as this is part of building relationships with the wider community, they were really keen to have community fundraising events. Um, so after our, focus, our three focus groups, we then designed a survey, um, which was to, to check that uh, the results of our focus groups transferred over a larger number of, of young people. Um, and we were able to gain over 640 responses from young people aged 16 to 24. Um, from um, geographically across the whole county. Um, and our, our main findings were that um, overall, um, all of the data supported the findings from the focus groups. Again, we saw very much a lack of local um, climate change understanding versus global. Um, again, importance of community involvement and the barriers were very similar, time, cost, convenience, and lack of being the decision maker in the household. Um, and then also we, it was a very clear in our um, results that young people were keen to engage more with the council. And through the survey, we were able to gain data on what this might look like and preferences here. Um, so here we looked at community, um, it was strongly recommended for communication through online channels, um, offering information and events. And they also really liked participating in the surveys and the focus groups. Um, so this was um, suggested for future work um, and interactions with school being a channel for this was popular. So the conclusions to our research um, are that this is a real opportunity for the council. The young people um, are really concerned about the climate emergency and are highly motivated to take action. Um, and these young people are embedded in lots of community networks already. Um, the key principles to facilitate youth action in Cambridgeshire that we found from our research are to uh, maintain diverse representation, to create direct communication channels with the council, um, to give consistent financial report and to build wider relationships with the community. Um, and the barriers that we identified included cost, convenience, and not being the household decision maker. And also um, we understand that currently Cambridgeshire County Council doesn't have a specialised infrastructure in place to effectively communicate with the young people and support them on um, climate issues. So to take our conclusions into recommendations, I think Olivia will take over now. Yeah, so our main recommendations from those conclusions um, for the council was to use a range of community engagement models to encourage and support youth climate change actions within the communities. Um, so firstly, we recommended setting up a youth environmental trust or committee in each Cambridgeshire district to try and support and further um, the work of networks that were kind of already existing, whether that's amongst schools or youth groups. Um, and passionate um, young people. Um, and this would require kind of council support and funding. Um, but following on from the community champions model specifically, we suggest um, setting up school eco lead teachers or um, students or representatives within particular youth organizations, uh, which can then reach out to their um, communities. And this model would um, hopefully increase the reach and engagement um, to younger people and also to less uh, well represented, less well represented demographics, uh, because we found that young people really valued the opportunity to reach out to other young people to um, engage in climate action uh, within their local area. Um, similarly, these kind of um, environmental trusts could 
um, lean towards more of a community um, trust um, set up. So maybe like a shared resource, like a shared um, tree planting or community farm that young people could be specifically involved with. Um, but we proposed um, a few um, opportunities that would be needed to facilitate um, these young people's actions. And this would be like running events and um, centering on community action. Um, and we thought of creating a free kind of educational course, which would help young people learn about climate issues, specifically some issues in their area, because often, um, as Izzy mentioned, young people had really good kind of global overview of climate issues, but maybe weren't as um, knowledgeable about local specific issues. Um, and uh, crucially, they young people really wanted to improve how they communicated about the climate crisis to both their peers, but also their parents and guardians. Um, and then we also thought that encouraging work experience in local environmental issues um, is something that the council could help with. Um, so in addition to consistent financial support for these kind of environmental committees and champions, um, we suggested the creation of dedicated grants available for young people for engaging in um, local climate action. Um, and then finally, drawing on our kind of own experience engaging with Cambridgeshire um, youth, we recommend running like regular focus groups and surveys to get a representation from across the county and then across the cities um, to better understand priorities. Um, because, yeah, the young people were so um, excited to be involved and um, really wanted to uh, engage more. Um, and so, yeah, we suggested in general the um, council could improve communication with young people through an improved social media presence um, specifically tailored to young people. Um, I don't know if the next slide, maybe Lisa. Oh, yeah. Um, and so we highlighted a couple of um, example social media accounts which could be used um, and like specifically using Instagram or maybe even TikTok um, as a platform to engage with um, younger people. And young people could even be used as kind of agents for change here because um, we felt that they really um, wanted to take up take part actively so um we actually got some students to um make an example social media video which we showed in our um committee meeting and um they this was students from Compton village college and they came up with the video in about 24 hours um and it's uh, really good and just shows how like useful they could be um as um valuable agents for change and influencers um as a kind of group of people um, oh, or as a community within Cambridgeshire. Um, yeah, so thank you. I think, and then this is just a pretend, this is just an infographic summary, which is going back to the um, young people themselves because we want to really keep them up to date with um, what we're, what the outcomes of our research have been. Thank you, Kuhuthi. This is great. Um, uh, this is some interesting findings and and great recommendations. And the fact that you take your recommendations back to the um, to the community is very very good. Um, so let's move to the last name. I think you're very much on time. Can I ask um, a quick question? I can't put my I can't I can't put my virtual hand up because I'm I'm host. I ask it, just something. <laughs> is that all right if I just ask ask the team a quick question? Um. I just in your in your when you were presenting the the kind of the focus groups and the the survey you, you mentioned this thing about um there was a response that said something like feel unable to persuade parents or guardians i just wondered if you could expand on that a little bit did you get a sense on what it what what was the barrier to persuading their parents or guardians was it a simple financial one was it something to do with circumstances and did it vary by did it vary by district um it was commonly mentioned I think um, in regards to diet I would say the most often and uh, so young people wanted to move towards a more plant-based diet but they didn't have the agency to make those decisions for their own diet when their parents or guardians were just making household decisions and also things like um, solar panels and transport where that comes down to more of a financial so I think financial and 
um, some people said lack of sort of um, taking them seriously. Um, if anyone else has anything to add. Yeah, no, I, I remember one person saying that their parents laughed at them when he or she was putting a lot of effort into recycling. But I think that's that was the minority. It was more about plant-based diet and yeah, electric cars, something like that. Thank you. Let's move forward to the um, question 14, which is the final team um, for this um, evening wrap-up event. And they'll be talking about how Cambridge have businesses that have set or are interested in setting carbon neutral or carbon negative targets invest to reduce carbon emissions and also reduce fuel poverty, both for all dependent communities and a wider public. Quite a long question. I think Aunt Angela will take it from here. Yeah, thanks so much, Peace. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking uh, about the fourth policy challenge question, um, where we were trying to address how businesses could become involved in um, Cambridgeshire's decarbonisation. Um, and the idea that we came up with was the Cambridgeshire Decarbonisation Fund. Um, so we'll take you a little bit through the work that we did over the last year today. Um, so the start of this work stemmed from actually a CUSPI policy challenge in 2019. Um, this was net zero Cambridgeshire, which you might have heard of. So that policy challenge actually tried to identify all of the carbon emissions and their sources in both Cambridgeshire and Peterborough in 2019. They ended up getting data from 2017. But what they identified was that businesses themselves contribute to at least 27 percent of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough's total CO2 footprint. Um, and also that um, transport and uh, domestic buildings contribute significantly to a significant portion of emissions. Um, so from this 2019 report, uh, the Cambridgeshire County Council tried to strive to find a way to link um, domestic homes and buildings to businesses and see if they could come up with a way in which businesses would be able to contribute um, some of their funding as businesses or as individuals to try and offset some of the carbon emissions which came from the domestic buildings and transport sector. Uh, so this was the starting point for our project and I will transfer it over to Campbell to talk a little bit about uh, where we went with that. The decarbonization fund provides the opportunity to engage local Cambridgeshire businesses and allow them to play an active role in making Cambridgeshire net zero. With business investment in the community, the County Council will be able to fund and organise projects to decarbonise the domestic sector and improve the quality of living across Cambridgeshire. Our goal in creating this decarbonisation fund is to create a sustainable, community-led decarbonisation partnership between businesses, the community and the Cambridgeshire local authorities. Next slide, please. So we decided to sort the projects that will be put forward and would go into this fund into three categories based on um, where the emission comes from. So our highest or first tier would be um, cutting the emissions at their source. So supplying clean energy from renewable energy projects at a community level. So this would be called avoiding the emissions entirely. Our second tier would be reducing emissions, either from nature or industrial um, sources. So this could be achieved by retrofitting individual homes or supplying more um, electric mobility in Cambridgeshire by increasing the um, e-mobility infrastructure through more charging stations, for example, or also targeting something that is concerned with natural um, emissions from the Fenlands, so this could include the Great Fen project. And if emissions can't be avoided or reduced, then hopefully they can be sequestered somehow. And the most obvious solution for this will be uh, planting more trees, um, where one existing project will be the 100 acre wood project, but there could be also others uh, in Cambridgeshire. There is still some capacity to increase the uh, um, the amount of land that is used for tree planting, but of course this is limited. So that's why it's our lowest priority tier. Um, 
because you just can't plant as many trees as needed to cut all the emissions that we are currently producing. Um, but we nevertheless propose to mix all these three tiers um, in the decarbonization fund. And with that, I'm handing over to Anna. So we propose to use the fair trade carbon pricing model um, to be able to price the carbon in Cambridgeshire. So the fair trade carbon price is calculated by adding the investment cost, the project cost, the carbon cost and a business margin and then taking away any revenues from the project um, and then dividing it by the number of credits that the project will create. So a credit is one ton of CO2 that is saved because of the project. So we adapted this um, formula for Cambridgeshire. So we've got the project costs, ongoing costs of a project, um, plus a business margin um, divided by the number of credits again. Um, and we've come up with a Cambridgeshire decarbonisation fund carbon price, which is the average over all the projects. So as Sabina just mentioned, over tree planting, over the Great Fen project, over any energy projects, we'd average the carbon cost for this. Um, and therefore one Cambridgeshire carbon credit would be equal to one tonne of CO2 saved from any of the projects in the fund. And just to note that this calculation doesn't account for inflation at the moment, and it excludes any potential revenues or benefits as these will become apparent in the longer term. Next slide, please. So decarbonisation is not just about mitigating climate change, but it's also closely intertwined with a multitude of social and economic issues that we face as a society. The Cambridgeshire Decarbonisation Fund provides a number of policy co-benefits in addition to decarbonisation. These benefits can be categorised into three groups. The first are the social benefits, giving democratic oversight of Cambridgeshire's carbon emissions through electing members of the board, allowing a fair energy transition through a high degree of transparency in the fund's decision-making process, creating tailored solutions that work best for Cambridgeshire and for its residents, and alleviating food poverty through cheaper energy. Next are the economic benefits, which includes taking ownership of local emissions and becoming less reliant on international or national projects that are run to re reduce our own emissions outside of Cambridgeshire, creating jobs and local expertise through the fund's projects, avoiding a future tax on carbon emissions that is set to be introduced by the UK government, and giving companies proof of social responsibility it means that they are showing that they're taking on social and ecological responsibility for the communities that most of their employees live and work in. And finally, and most importantly, the health benefits, and these would include reducing power sector and transport pollutant emissions. Every year in the UK, between 28,000 and 36,000 deaths are attributable to air pollution alone. And this way we can also reduce our burden on the NHS. So now I'll pass on to Campbell for the last slide. The Cambridgeshire Decarbonisation Fund should be a collaborative initiative between the council, local businesses and our communities. It is critical that we involve businesses and community members in the decision making process for the fund. We need to ensure that we present a clear and strong rationale to businesses for why it is better to support carbon reduction in Cambridgeshire rather than invest in decarbonisation elsewhere. This can be facilitated by getting insights into Cambridge business needs. In addition to this, we must encourage the formation of project ideas from community leaders so the funds enacts projects which are relevant to Cambridgeshire communities. Thank you. Um, Lisa, do you want to round off? Um, first of all, are there any questions for the Q4 team? All right then. And okay. thank, many thanks to Cheryl um, for the um, for the team for the Q4 team and also um, Dustin. Um, I think I'll hand over to Councillor Ian now to round up since there are no questions. 
thanks a lot of peace. We're early, aren't we? It's a, it's a, it's a good job. I, I nearly, I nearly started the Gather Town description from seven o'clock, so it's a good chance I start off it from six thirty. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any licenses. Um, I just want to uh, highlight something that Dustin said uh, at the beginning about um, just the, the brilliant resilience of the teams through all this year, and, and still coming up with recommendations that are of such, such brilliantly high quality. Um, it's a couple of people asking the question, so I just thought I'd address the question of next year's challenges, um, because for anyone who doesn't know, Cambridge County Council is up for election in six weeks now I think it is seven weeks I'm um, looking at sort of nod or not is it six weeks now or seven weeks um now because Cambridge County Council we elect all our councillors in one go so all 61 councillors are up for election um theoretically it means the entire council could change hands so it seemed inappropriate running the policy challenges in the same way this year because you could get challenges councillors setting a challenge and then that council doesn't get re-elected and then that will happen midway through the challenge so instead what we're going to do is a, a shortened version of the policy challenge challenges um which will the the, the dustin will obviously running because he'll still be around um hopefully <laughs> as he's not up for election um and they'll they'll be based upon some of this year's policy challenges so they'll, so they'll use work that's kind of already been agreed and they'll be slightly shortened and that sort of gets us gets us then back into the normal the normal cycle of the policy challenges 